One bromopentane belongs to a class of molecules known as alkyl halides, and it's structurally quite simple. On the left here, we have pentane, which is an example of a simple alkane. On the right, we have our one bromopentane, which is very similar, except one hydrogen has been replaced with bromine. It's specifically called one bromopentane and not just bromopentane, so that we know exactly where the bromine is on the pentane molecule. If we were to move the bromine atom to a different carbon, the name could change to something like 2-bromopentane or even 3-bromopentane. In general, alkyl halides are very useful in organic chemistry, and they're used in a multitude of reactions. I would say that two of the most common reactions that alkyl halides are used in are substitutions and Grignard reactions. I've carried out these types of reactions a few times on my channel, and if you're interested, I've provided some links in the description. In this video, we're making a bromoalkane, but we can also make alkyl halides using the other halogens, like fluorine, chlorine, or iodine. The choice of which halogen is used is important, because it will influence both the physical properties of the alkyl halide, as well as its reactivity. In the end though, there's really no best halogen to use, and it really depends on what you're trying to do. The one bromopentane that I make in this video will be used to make something called caproic acid. As some of you might know, I'm a pretty big fan of things that don't smell very good, and caproic acid is supposed to be pretty repulsive. In literature, it's often said to have a goat-like or animal-like scent, and I wanted to check it out for myself. For this preparation, we need three main things. Sodium bromide, concentrated sulfuric acid, and one pentanol. In terms of quantities, I used 78 grams of sodium bromide, 65 milliliters of 1-pentanol, and 60 milliliters of the concentrated sulfuric acid. To start things off, I added 75 milliliters of distilled water to a 500 milliliter round bottom flask. With strong stirring, I added 78 grams of sodium bromide in several small portions. The sodium bromide is added in small amounts, because if we were to add it all at once, it would jam up the stir bar. Not all of the sodium bromide is going to dissolve, so it's normal if there's still a little bit left at the bottom. The sodium bromide solution is then placed on an ice bath, and things are allowed to cool. Above the flask, I set up an addition funnel, and I slowly added 60 milliliters of concentrated sulfuric acid. The addition of the sulfuric acid releases a lot of heat, and it's important to keep the temperature as low as possible. In theory, we don't absolutely need an ice bath, but if things get too hot, we can actually start to produce bromine, which we really don't want. When the sulfuric acid is added to the flask, it reacts with the sodium bromide to form sodium bisulfate and hydrobromic acid. Hydrobromic acid is the active reagent that will react with the alcohol to make the bromoalkane. When a reagent is made in the reaction flask itself, instead of being pre-made, it's said to be made in situ, which can be roughly translated to on-site. There are various different reasons why in chemistry you'd want to make a reagent in situ, but here it's just much more time efficient because we don't have to prepare hydrobromic acid in advance. When the sulfuric acid is added, it forms sodium sulfate, which has a lower solubility than sodium bromide. As we approach the end of the addition, we might have a lot of solid salt floating around, which might clump up and prevent things from stirring. To get things to stir again, the ice bath was removed, and things were allowed to warm up a little bit. The next thing to add to the reaction flask is the alcohol, so to the same addition funnel that we had our sulfuric acid in, I added 65 milliliters of 1-pentanol. With strong stirring, the 1-pentanol is added slowly and dropwise. The addition of the alcohol will generate some heat, so we add it slowly and with strong stirring to make sure that we don't generate any hot spots. It really doesn't generate that much heat though, so we can add it much quicker than we added the sulfuric acid. By the end of the addition, some of the 1-pentanol has reacted to form 1-bromopentane, but we still have a lot of unreacted 1-pentanol left over. To push things forward and to get our reaction to completion, we need to heat things up, and the best way to do this is to carry out a reflux. The contents of the reaction flask are heated to the boiling point, and the vapors that come off are recondensed back into the flask. 
This allows us to heat the reaction to the boiling point of the mixture with very little loss. To get things started, we get some strong stirring going and I turn on the heating mantle. Initially, the solution was opaque due to undissolved salts, but as it heats up, the salts dissolve into solution and it becomes clear. Once the contents of the flask are boiling and we have liquid recondensing, we start our timer and we let the reflux go for about two hours. The type of reaction that we're carrying out is generally known as a substitution reaction. I've covered substitution reactions though in previous videos, so I don't really want to get into too many details here. For those of you who are interested in knowing more though, I'll provide a link in the description to a more detailed video. The overall reaction is shown here, where the hydroxyl group of the 1-pentanol is being converted to a bromine. The conversion from the alcohol to the bromoalkane is facilitated by the hydrobromic acid that we made in situ. Now I'm just going to quickly go over the mechanism. In the first step, the hydroxyl group of 1-pentanol is protonated to form a water molecule. The water molecule that's formed is quite stable on its own, and it's pretty much just looking for an excuse to leave. In one concerted step, a bromide ion from hydrobromic acid attacks, and the water molecule pops off. In organic chemistry, there are many types of substitution reactions, but this one is specifically known as SN2. After two hours, the reflux is complete, so I take away the heating mantle and I let things cool down a little bit. When we take a look at the flask from the side, we can see that we have two layers, where the upper layer is our 1-bromopentane. To separate the 1-bromopentane from the reaction mixture, we're going to carry out a simple distillation. Instead of using simple distillation to separate the crude 1-bromopentane, I could have also used a separatory funnel. Both methods are equally as viable, but I think the distillation gives a slightly cleaner product. In the end though, it doesn't really matter, because the 1-bromopentane we get from both methods is crude, and we have to redistill it anyway. The literature boiling point of 1-bromopentane is 130C, so we collect everything that comes over below this. Below 130C, we should be collecting three main things, water, azeotropic hydrobromic acid, and our product 1-bromopentane. In the reaction flask, we'll leave behind sulfuric acid, unreacted 1-pentanol, and salt side products. When I look at the receiving flask at the end, I can see that we have two layers, and honestly at this point, I don't know exactly which one our product is. The density of the aqueous layer is pretty much determined by how much hydrobromic acid is present, and I have no way of knowing this. If there's very little hydrobromic acid present, the 1-bromopentane has a higher density and it should be on the bottom, but if there's a lot of hydrobromic acid present, then the 1-bromopentane is going to be sitting on top. This really isn't a problem though, and when I do the workup, I'll show you how I determine which layer is which. When we take a look at the reaction flask, we're left with a nice syrupy mixture of sulfuric acid and salts. As long as it's hot, it remains a liquid, but as it cools down, it solidifies. This really isn't a huge problem though, and the salts are pretty easily washed out with water. The contents of our receiving flask is then transferred to a separatory funnel. Once everything's in the separatory funnel, we still don't know which layer is which, but we'll find out after I dilute things with a little bit of water. I add a whole bunch of water to the separatory funnel, and this serves to dilute the aqueous layer and lower its density. By adding something like 100 milliliters, we pretty much guarantee that the aqueous layer will have a lower density than the 1-bromopentane. The separatory funnel is taken off the stand, and I shake it to mix things up. Every so often, we pause and open the stopcock to release any pressure that might have built up. After the layers have settled, our 1-bromopentane should be at the bottom, and this is drained off into an Erlenmeyer flask. The upper aqueous layer in the separatory funnel is waste, and it can be disposed of. We aren't done with our washing steps though, and the 1-bromopentane is poured back into the separatory funnel. To the separatory funnel, I then pour in 25 milliliters of concentrated sulfuric acid. We add the sulfuric acid here because it's good at cleaning out and getting rid of any side products or 1-pentanol that might remain. Just like before, we take our separatory funnel off the stand and we mix things up. It's important to be especially careful in these steps though because we are working with concentrated sulfuric acid. After things are mixed up, 
The funnel is placed back on the stand. The layers are allowed to separate and we drain off the lower sulfuric acid layer. Our one bromopentane is much cleaner, but now it's full of sulfuric acid, so we need to wash it with a little bit of water. The addition of the sulfuric acid gave us a yellow color, but when we shake things up with water, it goes back to being white. The solution is placed back on the stand, the layers are allowed to separate, and again our lower 1-bromopentane layer is drained off. The 1-bromopentane is then returned to the separatory funnel for one last washing. This final washing is to just make sure that there's no acid that might remain, and to do this, we use 100 milliliters of saturated sodium bicarbonate solution. Just like all the other washings, we mix things thoroughly, we let the layers separate, and then we drain off the lower 1-bromopentane. The cloudiness of the 1-bromopentane is due to the presence of water, so we're going to need to dry things up a little bit using a drying agent. I chose to use calcium chloride as my drying agent, so I just dumped a bunch in, swirled it around, and let it stand for a while. The calcium chloride dries the 1-bromopentane by forming a complex with the water. The flask was stoppered and I left for an hour, and when I came back we can see that the solution is much clearer. The 1-bromopentane is separated from the calcium chloride by just filtering it through a little bit of cotton. I filtered things directly into a round bottom flask because the next step is to carry out a distillation. After everything had filtered through, I set things up for a fractional distillation. To get the distillation started, I turn on the heating mantle and I cover the fractional column with some aluminum foil. Just after several minutes, things will come to a boil and the vapor will start to travel up the column. Eventually, the vapor made it to the top of the column and finally to the condenser and we start to collect things at around 70 C. The first stuff that came over here was slightly yellow and the boiling point of our 1-bromopentane is 130, so this clearly isn't our product. At around 125 C, our receiving flask was swapped out for a new one. The rate of the distillation picked up, and the bulk of the 1-bromopentane came over between 125 and 130 C. The distillation was stopped when there was very little liquid left over in the distillation flask. The apparatus was dismantled, and when we take a look at our receiving flask, we see we have quite a bit of product. The 1-bromopentane that we collected here came over between 125 and 130 C, and this is a pretty broad boiling range. For me, this is pure enough, but if a higher purity was needed, I would have had to distill it probably a few more times. I actually already made 1-bromopentane in a previous video using phosphorus tribromide, and I figured I would just combine everything. At the bottom of the bottle, we have molecular sieves to keep things dry, but they're pretty old, so I decided to add some new ones. After the sieves had been added, I poured in the 1-bromopentane that we got from this video. The final yield of 1-bromopentane was about 60 grams, which represents a percent yield of about 66%. The normal yields for this reaction are between 80 and 90%, so what I got here is quite low. I'm honestly not sure why the yield is so much lower than it should be. Anyway, I have more than enough to make microproic acid, and that video should be posted eventually. I think I'll post the lithium peroxide video next, because that has been sitting on the shelf for a while. Anyway, as usual, I'd like to extend a big thanks to all of my supporters on Patreon, and especially those who donate $5 or more. Anyone who donates and supports me on Patreon gets to see my videos 24 hours before I release it to YouTube, and if you donate $5 or more, you get your name at the end of the video, like you see here. In the next few months though, I want to work on my Patreon page a lot, and I want to get more rewards going, and maybe even get some higher tier ones, and I want to also offer some Patreon exclusive content. Also, as usual, here's the videos that I've currently filmed and the ones I plan to work on. If you have any suggestions or ideas, please feel free to leave them in the comments.